Hi guys, welcome back to the West Yorkshire Football Show. Hope you're doing very, very well. Um, I'm here to have a, a little bit of a post-match reaction from the Sunderland game last night. Um, and also to briefly talk about uh, very sad news today of, of Stuart Dallas's uh, retirement. First off, once again, same as the last uh, post-match reaction video, let me apologise um, for the lack of content. It's down to me again. Um, I said to Brownie last night, I'm still not well enough to do sit there and do a full hour review as some of you guys know I had to um, drop off a little bit earlier from the um, the review on Monday I can only kind of talk for 10-15 minutes before having banging headaches and chests going all over the place but I am um, hopefully on the mend I'm starting to feel a little bit better day by day and um, so yeah fingers crossed we're, we're fully back to full action I have committed to Brownie to 100% be doing the review on Saturday after the Blackburn game where fingers crossed we uh, we have something to celebrate because the, the results, obviously, last four have been a bit trickier and performances have been a bit trickier, but let's um, let's get into, into that first off. So, last night for me, um, I wasn't surprised to see the, the, the team um, that, that went out. We all know that by now that Daniel Parker's going to work in a certain kind of way. And we can all have his opinions on whether it's right, whether it's wrong. We, you know, we, as fans, we want to see this player play or that player play. And um, I'll get on to my opinions on some of that um, as as I as I chat about this. But yeah, the team is what it is. I think at this stage of the season, it probably picks itself. I can understand the the reluctance to gamble um, on changing too much at this stage of the season. I do think we're still battling in, battling some injuries um, within the squad. We know Ampadu was touch and goes to whether he played. He ended up coming out and still playing the whole 90 minutes um, and gaining a clean sheet. So, you know, fair play to, to Ethan. He, he, he managed to pull himself through and do the business for us as he has done all season. Um, I think that was a, a big relief considering the fact that then as options would have been looking at Liam Cooper and, and even more um, of a gamble would have been at this stage of the season Charlie Cresswell um, who's barely featured at all this season it's not the really stage of the season where you want to start bringing in a player that's not played any first team minutes so yeah we, we you know we saw the team and there definitely is a, a little bit of a form issue right now I think on the day I thought Somerville was pretty poor I thought Gio was um, pretty poor as well giving the ball away far too often trying too hard and always trying to pick the most dangerous pass and rather than sometimes playing the simple pass, there'd be a, a ball out wide to Dan James or to Somerville, but he'll try and thread the needle through to the player that's running through the middle, um, or you know, it'll then be under hit or over hit, and it, it it was frustrating to see at times. And I think for me, this is down to inexperience. It's down to naivety. We know these players have the the quality, but not many of them have have been in this position before and have have had as much as what our boys have right now riding on their shoulders and um, I've seen a lot of content creators say um, and I think this is spot on in that earlier on in the season for us and for the players it was fun and um, this season was fun and enjoyable at this stage of the season it's not fun it's about doing the business it's about getting the result and getting the points over the line and getting the job done and when that reality hits performances and, and decisions that you'd have just been making without thinking about it you overthink it you overthink it half a yard you try and make it too complicated you try and overplay it you try and overdo it and i think that's what's happening to a lot of us boys right now especially our two most creative players in G uh, geo rutter and um chris somerville um i think you've seen that with with archie as well at times you know snapping at things snatching at things that he wouldn't have been snatching at earlier on in the season um Getting into the game, the first half wasn't great. Um, I thought I still thought we started well. One moment, please. I still thought we started well. Um, Sunderland, for me, came very similar to the way that they set up at the Stadium of Light, and um, when we played them and lost their one 0 they came with a game plan to stifle us, um, to play our game or to stop us playing our game over playing their own game. Um, they came today with nothing to play or yesterday sorry with nothing to play for and S House their way to, to a draw that's how I see it um, 
they had a couple of okay chances on the counter, but apart from that, it was all leads, really. Um, even in the first half, we got into some dangerous areas, and this is where I keep on mentioning decision-making. We got into the areas where you needed to build that attack. It was the pass before the, the pass, if you like. The pass before the assist was the wrong one. We were getting into them half moments, Rutter constantly getting space in and around the edge of the box and then making the wrong decision. Um, so, for me, it wasn't structurally or tactically that was a problem. It was a little bit slower than I'd have liked. But the real problem in, in the performance was the final decision making. Um, whether that be, you know, Pat blazing one across the box when he'd run in smartly in behind. You know, just have a bit of composure and pick your pass. Even put a foot, put a foot on the ball and stop for a second. Then play the pass. Um, so... For, for me, the, the performance was missing that final pass to then create the goal. Um, I still think we had enough opportunities while not having a lot of shots on target to win the game. Um, at this stage of the season, performances and you know the level of performances, the, the winning the games 3 4 5 no, just doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is getting the points on the board. Um, you know, we've seen these these blips in, in form and in results happen all over the place, whether that be Ipswich losing in the derby at the weekend and not playing well. You know, th their performances previously to that at Bristol and Southampton, they deserve to lose both of them. Uh, sorry, Blackburn and, and Southampton, they deserve to lose both of them. Um, but they got them over the line. Leicester going to Millwall away and losing. I mean, who'd have picked that? Millwall are, are terrible and they've been on really bad form over the last three or four games, you know, losing to Huddersfield at the weekend and then they go and beat Leicester. It's unbelievable. Well, that's the championship at this stage of the season. That's football at this stage of the season when there's so much riding on these games. Results happen and performances kind of go by the wayside. So for me, last night's performance, the only thing it was missing was at this stage of the season especially was a goal. And, and we can't say that we didn't have chances, we did. Not only that, and I'm going to get on to talking about the, the, the refereeing and the officiating and, and JB being on, on watch gate of the referees again. But the the standard of officiating yesterday was horrendous. Um, Ballard should have been yellow carded within the first 10 minutes. A, a cynical foul on, on Bamford. He wasn't. He was get, uh, let off. He was then yellow carded maybe five minutes after that for a challenge that was l it was less of a yellow card than the first one was. So he, he then should have gone. He then was the first one that sent his elbow out, clear and ball. The referee's looking directly at it, you can see it, and he, he goes like that to knock the ball out of play. That's the second yellow card as well, and a penalty. And then we've all seen the, the one on our nine in the second half. I mean, it's clear as day, and the assistant should be helping the referee if the referee can't see But again, the referee's looking straight at it. He can see that all nine has got maybe three foot to Rodon's head, and he's, he's lifted his arm up and, and punched the ball clear. Now... Some fans will say, well, we can't bank on the referees um, and the officials to, to win us a game of football. No, you can't. But these moments matter. At this stage of the season, they extremely matter. They are massive. So getting, getting a penalty in, in a tight game like that and going on and winning the game 1-0 or 2-0, you know, from that point, it changes the game completely. Rodon is about to head that at goal. That could have been a goal, but 9 stopped it. It's a red card as well. So for, for me... I didn't think last night was bad. Sunderland, sure, they're not great. They they picked up a, a bit of form at the weekend, got a good point. Previously to that, they did lose 5-1 at home. They've been a bit of a basket case all season, really, Sunderland. But we do know they've got some good players. We do know that they've got some talent within that, within that team. So for me, sure, I think we needed to win last night. But Leicester has been saying the same thing. Ipswich will be saying the same thing tonight. And they've got a, a tricky game against Watford at home. We've seen what Watford can do. They've played very well against us. They're undefeated in four since Cleverly's come in. They've picked up some form. They've got some talent within that team. I wouldn't bank on um, Ipswich just rolling Watford over tonight. I could be completely wrong, but I wouldn't bank on it at all. <coughs> I think that being said, Saturday is is crucial. It is crucial. And we then go into back-to-back -back away games. Um, I think Middlesbrough... We'll have very little to play for and we'll be keen to do a number on us. That being said, they are going to be missing Sam Greenwood, Luke Ayling, um, who will be uh, long-tied. Um, so they will be without 
two of their first team players, to be fair, um, and hopefully we can go up there and do the job. And we had a very similar game to, uh, uh, when we last got promoted against Middlesbrough at their place, and we we managed to crawl out of there with a one nil win. It was a tough game. It was very similar to the Barnsley at home game in the running that season. That's what happens at this stage of the season. Um, so yeah, going into the Middlesbrough and QPR game, and the QPR game is going to be tricky. They're going to have a lot to play for after um, squandering a lead against Sheffield Wednesday yesterday. They're still going to be in the, the relegation battle, I would have thought. Um, the Blackburn game on Saturday is crucial, crucial for, for the rest of this season. While I don't think it's terminal losing, uh, not winning the game yesterday, it obviously wasn't ideal. Saturday, I think, is a little bit different. Um, anything, again, could happen at this stage of the season, but I think if we have real... Um, if we want to give ourselves a real expectation of being able to finish inside the top two going into the last three games that we've got, I think that's a must win. I think Blackburn is a must win game. So yeah, let's not overreact, guys. Um, I've seen a lot of unbelievably wild takes on, on Twitter and social media in general with regards to Daniel Farker and the players. They're not up to it, some of them. Some of them, some people saying they're not motivated, they're not working hard enough. Like, you're not watching, you're not watching the game it's as simple as that you're not watching the game you're just taking the result and saying no of course they've not ma managed to get a win and um, they're not trying hard enough it's it's bizarre um i do want to have my say on on bamford and joseph debate um i've been a staunch defender of, of pat pretty much since bielsa's time um i understood what he gave the team then i understand what he gives the team now um, the start of this run, beginning of 2024, started with the reintroduction of Patrick Bamford back to the, the number nine spot in this in this team. Um, we play better when he's there. It's just, it's as simple as that. Um, previously to last night, his three previous performances were poor, as were a number of the other uh, the other players within the team. But individually, he didn't do enough. He wasn't good enough. I, I hear that and recognise that. But is it this, the stage of the season with five, four games now left to play that we risk all of our hopes on an unproven young number nine? Um, and the answer to that question is no. You know, the experience that Daniel Fark has got, same as Marcelo Bielsa, when Marcelo Bielsa stuck with him through, you know, all the misses and all the chances, stuck with him because he offers so much more than just putting the ball in the back of the net. And that can be hard for a casual football fan to understand because that's the most important thing in a game, get that. But sometimes, without the play beforehand, them chances never arise anyway. Yeah, they, they, they don't happen without a player like him. Now, I'm sure that over time, Mateo Joseph will be able to um, do exactly the same role as well. But, you know, what if Joseph misses a chance after five minutes and then he, his confidence is shot and he can't deal with getting bullied by Ballard? He's not got that experience to deal with it. It's playing on his head for the, the rest of the 60 minutes. We then get to the 60, 65th, 70th minute. Look to his bench and what have we got? We've got Patrick Bamford, who is ineffectual when coming off the bench. It, it's not the right time, guys. You, some of you won't want to hear it. Some of you will blindly disagree. I've had a lot of uh, debates back and forward over the last you know 12 hours or whatever with regards to uh, Bamford's uh, performance last night. Some fans are just blindly criticising him. He had a good game. He had a good game, guys. He did his job. I'm not saying he had a great game, but in terms of what he needed to do for the for the team, bar the, the, the two chances, the right foot one that gets hacked over the bar and then the, the cross, which he should have done better with, he, he did absolutely fine yesterday. He held the ball up well. He ran the channels well. He was causing Ballard problems all game. Um, so for me, you're not, you're not watching if you're criticising last night's Patrick Bamford performance. There was far bigger problems on the pitch than Bamford, but what we seem to do as a fan base is hook onto one blame, one area of, of concern, whether that used to be Luke Ayling, whether it's Liam Cooper when Cooper's in the team, whether it's Patrick Bamford. If Mateo Joseph was um, in the side last night and had exactly the same performance as Bamford, nobody would have been saying anything about Joseph's performance. Nobody would have been saying anything. They'd have picked on somebody else for the reason that we drew 0-0, because we still would have drawn 0-0. Yeah, they, 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 oh, very, very likely that would have still drawn 0-0. Gio Rutter was terrible last night, in my opinion. He he was woeful. Probably his worst, worst performance this year, I would say, 2024. Um, but nobody's saying anything because it's Gio Rutter. And sure, he's got some credit in the bank. But Pat's also got credit in the bank. And we can't wait to just jump all over him. It's just, 
It's just weird mindset. And at this stage of the season, a bit of a rallying call for anybody that does end up watching this. Get behind the boys. You know, social media, hopefully the players are not looking. It's not a good place for, for them to, to go on. But they do see it. They do. And, you know, some people calling players out, being personal and calling out the manager and saying that he's not right. It's bizarre. It's a bizarre, bizarre standpoint when we're one point from top, sat in second position, going into the last four games of the season. Just my take. Um, just to finish, because I've been going 15 minutes, and as you can see, I'm starting to struggle. <laughs> um, shoot Dallas. I mean, this is a great way to, to finish today, because last night wasn't really a, a positive, unfortunately. still believe we'll, we'll finish top two. I do. I think it's it's in the balance, of course it is, but we um it's I'm gonna say it's in our hands because I think Ipswich and Leicester will also drop more points before the end of the season. So just in try and enjoy it as best you can. On to Stuart Dallas. Um what a fantastic servant for our football club, two hundred and sixty plus appearances. Um I think out of the stalwart of that Bielsa side, and when I say stalwarts I'm talking Liam Cooper, I'm talking um Luke Ayling, I'm talking Patrick Bamford, I'm talking Stuart Dallas, um, maybe even Matthias Click and Jack Harrison you could kind of put into that pocket as well. Um, for me, Stuart Dallas was the most talented of them all. Um, he was the, the, the best technically, um, and he combined that with fantastic work rate, um, desire, passion, enthusiasm, and he was always first name on the team sheet throughout Bielsa's period. That's how it felt anyway. Um, if he wasn't needed at left back, he was at centre midfield. If he wasn't needed at centre midfield, he played out wide. If Aileen was out, he played at right back. When the left back spot came open again, you never doubted that uh, Stuart Dallas would be able to deal with that perfectly. He was a fantastic member of that championship winning team. And I'm, I'm super, super proud of... of what he became, you know, what a steal of a signing from Brentford when we we brought him over under Uwe Rossler, um, you know, even before Bielsa, he was a he was a a good player, a real real good player, stalwart of of the team before Bielsa, pre Bielsa, playing out wide. Um, never forget the two goals at Manchester City away under lo in lockdown, we're down to ten men. Stuart Dallas scores from the the edge of the box in the first half, in off the post, goes all the way across the line and goes in the the opposite side. And then Alioski's pass through to, to Dallas in the 90th minute to win against arguably the best team the Premier League has, has ever seen in Manchester City. Um, typifies everything that, that is good about Leeds United and what we want to kind of be known for and, and, you know, be resembled with, if you like. Um, and I think, you know, everything that Stuart Dallas has shown since his injury still travelling home and away every game to be part of the group and to be part of the squad to help lend his experience um, it just says everything about the guy he obviously loves Leeds United I'm absolutely blown away and delighted that Leeds United have already made it known that there's going to be a position for Stuart Dallas within the setup after um, his retirement at the end of the season which I think is fantastic he's a great person to have around the club but it shows that we care as a club about his players because in a time where in football loyalty doesn't really exist from both ends and you can understand why players don't show it either because the club so often don't if they decide that you're no longer um, deemed you know you, you deem surplus to requirements they'll ship you out they'll get money for you they'll get you off the books they'll rip up your contract whatever um, we've both shown um, I think loyalty each way um, with, with Stuart Dallas uh, and I, I'm delighted for him um, that he's got that to fall back on. You know, gutted for him that he's having to finish his playing career at 32 year old. He's still got so much left to, to offer. If he'd have not had that injury, he'd have gone on to make another 100 or so, 150 maybe even appearances for Leeds United. He'd have probably broken the 100 caps barrier for Northern Ireland as well. You know, I think he was at 50 some. Excuse me, 50 something, 60 uh, apps, uh, appearances for, for Northern Ireland. He'd have gone on to break the under barrier. I'm, I'm, I feel almost sure of that. I mean, it is is the kind of player and profile and person that have gone on playing to 36, 37, 38 year old, um, and because of his versatility, he'd have, he'd have always been able to get to get games. So, yeah, gutted for him. I think it'll be a massive rallying call on Saturday. I'm hoping the fans. I'm hoping that we're winning the game. Um, on Saturday at half time, so we're you know the enthusiasm's there. Stuart Dallas will whip us up, and we'll go on to win that game. 
you know, two or three nil, hopefully, make it comfortable and have a celebration of Stuart Dallas's career. So yeah, I just wanted to say marching on together to Stuart Dallas um, is I, is certainly a, a modern day legend for me. Same as I would consider Liam Cooper and Luke Haley modern day legends. I would consider Stuart Dallas exactly the same. Um, and I hope he goes on to a great career with whatever he does at, at Leeds United. So yeah, that's um, where I'm going to finish it for today, guys. That's 20 minutes. Um, I will be back on Saturday after the game with Brownie. I promise you, and regardless of how I'll, how I am, I'll be there on, on Saturday. And hopefully we, we can talk about picking up another three points and pushing towards uh, that top two. So yeah, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, do all the good stuff. We're 10 away, I think, from, from 1,000 subscribers, which is amazing. I'd love you to um, to check out more of us content as and when it comes. We'll always be dropping content, and between now and the end of the season, it's going to get feisty. There's going to be plenty of um, opinions flying around. Um, so, yeah, look forward to seeing you soon. Matching on together. Up the boys. See you Saturday.